Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Green 19 podcast. Some Green Bay Packers chatter from PackersNews.com. I am joined by Ryan Wood of the Green Bay Press Gazette. He is here. I am J.R. Radcliffe, and we're chatting about a couple things. The Packers schedule, as everyone knows by now, has been out now for uh, almost a week, and uh, and we know uh, we know kind of how the 2024 season lays out. OTAs, organized team activities, are just about to get going. In Green Bay, we've got some questions, some interesting things that, uh, that I'm sure everybody will be following, uh, along with Ryan Wood, our colleagues Tom Silverstein, Pete Doherty will be there. But uh, but we got we got to talk about it, Ryan. And I want to start with the schedule because, on paper, which of course is a, is a, always a delicate way of looking at things, on paper, the Packers were supposedly going to be facing one of the toughest schedules, if not the toughest schedule in the NFC, based on the winning percentage of the teams from the year before. But after all laid out on Wednesday night, well. Let's be honest, piece by piece throughout the day Wednesday, uh, it, it became pretty clear that the Packers have kind of an okay schedule. They they don't face anybody coming off of a bye. They've got uh, they've got a nicely situated week ten by week, and you know it's 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 kind of lays out like you you'd expect them to be able to make maybe go on a run early in the season, and then uh, and then you've got to run a primetime games later on. It seems like okay. It seems like the Packers are maybe one of the winners of the schedule release, as as several national outlets opined. Give me your top of mind thoughts as you look at where things lay in 2024. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Do you look at it based on structure or do you look at it what's actually important? That's who they play. Because who they play, they're not getting a lot of favors there. Uh, this is a brutal schedule when it comes to opponents, at least on paper, right? And it it reminds me of when Matt LaFleur was after the season, at the very onset of this offseason, saying to his young guys, speaking through the media, to, directly to his young players and saying – what you went through in 2023 is not at all like what's going to, you're going to go through in 2024. And he was talking about expectations for a team that rose precipitously, just absolutely ascension uh, in 2023. But he could have been talking about the gauntlet of the schedule too, because only two teams, only two opponents on this schedule had fewer than seven wins last year, the Titans and the Cardinals. Only you know, there, there were six teams with double digit wins, six playoff teams. There would have been seven, but the Seattle Seahawks, who they play on the road in prime time in the toughest venue to play on the road in prime time in all the league, mm -hmm. the, the Seattle Seahawks only didn't make the, the, the playoffs because they lost a strength of victory tiebreaker to the Packers, which, yeah, it's kind of it's startling to remember that that's how the Packers got into the postseason last yeah. year was a strength of victory win. So the, who they play is brutal. The structure is very favorable. They they don't have they they got a lot of breaks in the structure maybe a it's almost like a, a kudos to okay you're going to play some some real dogs on the schedule right so it depends on how you look at it I think it's very similar to a year ago when you saw on paper well they better get their wins early because late is really really hard the, obviously the difference is that a year ago it didn't turn out that way at all the, you you look a year ago at you know, the, the, the trips to Las Vegas and Denver, like, oh, those are wins. They got to win those games. They lost those games. Mm -hmm. You look late in the season. Okay, they've got Justin Herbert, the Lions on the road in Thanksgiving, Patrick Mahomes back to back to back. They, they, they ain't winning those games, and they end up winning those games. So it's all on paper. Who knows what's going to happen? But on paper, you look, okay, they have a chance to go on a run early in the season, and then there's a gauntlet, 49ers, the – Miami Dolphins at Thanksgiving at home in four straight days. The very next week on the road in Detroit, that's going to be real good. There's a gauntlet late in the season. That's how it is on paper. We'll see how it actually shakes out on the field. Yeah, if we're looking at it uh, as two halves of the season, you look at the first half, and, and it is exactly what you described. There's some games in there that you would think, well, the Packers should win those games, and maybe it goes that way and maybe it doesn't. There are two games that jump out at me. First of all, we've, we've talked at great length about the game in Brazil – against the Philadelphia Eagles, they do get a mini buy out of that, which you'd expect. You know, they play the, the subsequent Sunday at Lambeau Field. That is a home game against the Indianapolis Colts. Perhaps, Ryan, perhaps Tyrese Halliburton, Wisconsin native. I've heard of him. The Indiana Pacers will be there in attendance. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just throwing something out there. Could be. You never know. Um, I know the uh, Pacers are near and dear to your heart. And then, Oh, uh, I'm, I'm over the moon, JR. I know you are. Don't even get me started. Bet legendary stuff from Tyrese Halliburton in Game Seven at the Garden, absolutely. And then, uh, and then Minnesota, a team that I think is super interesting because you just wonder how they're going to be with JJ McCarthy. That's the first divisional opponent you face in Week Four, 
And then uh, Houston, a couple weeks after that, Houston is a noon game. They have a lot of primetime games on the schedule. Uh, four in a row, in fact, later in the season. Games that I think you'd expect to be on the primetime schedule. Houston, C.J. Stroud, Jordan Love. I mean, and somebody else made this point. Jordan Love is going to get to match up with some of the best quarterbacks in football. Caleb Williams, yeah. of course. Among them, Jared Goff, if you put him in that in that category, and you probably do. But the, C.J. Stroud, uh, Jalen Hurts to start the season. C.J. Stroud's a, a pretty good one, too. And that game actually being at noon kind of surprises me. That would that would seem to be one of the more high profile, you know, sort of young team matchups in the NFL that season. You got to kind of look at what else going on on the schedule. I believe that's a Chiefs 49ers week. So that's a pretty big game that's going to get some of that like later afternoon or primetime love. But I was surprised that was going to be a noon game. There's actually a pretty, you know, for people who miss those noon games, who feel like that the primetime schedule has ramped up to the point that there aren't as many noon games, you know, they got. They got six noon games out of seven weeks once they come back from Brazil. That's that's kind of cool, I guess. If you if you're into that old school thing. First of all, I love it. But who, who would if 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 you're saying that C.J. Stroud and Jordan Love should not be a noon game, which I'm not disagreeing with you there. Who because they, they still hit their max allotment, right? They're still five yes. prime time games. Who would you take off? Well, I, I guess probably versus the Saints that Monday night game. Although that's yeah. a, that you know Monday night is its own is its own thing. The Packers don't want to touch that game because that is night, late in season, late December at Lambeau against New Orleans mm -hmm. at, on the frozen thunder. That's set up very well for the Packers. The Packers are very thrilled with that. Yeah, I guess the only other one would be the one in, against Miami, but that's on Thanksgiving. So that's its own thing. That's not going anywhere. You know, the game that for me is going to be, look, let's start with the opener. That's a tough game for me to pick. And I, I you know, we, I don't have to pick it now. We're in middle of May, and we mm -hmm. have a long time before going down to Brazil. But I, I just, I don't know, I don't know what to think of that game. I don't know what to expect, uh, barring any unforeseen injuries in camp, or, because you want to talk about two teams that ended last season on total opposite trajectories. One going straight north, the other going straight south. That and. I still think the Eagles are good. Like I, you know, two years ago, this was the class of the NFC. Two years ago, say what you want about Jalen Hurts last season, it's deserved. Two years ago, he was in the Super Bowl, putting on an absolute show. Like he's shown it. He's he's put it on film in this league, uh, and a lot of that, yeah, you know, obviously he he can throw the ball, but a lot of that's athleticism. That yeah, at this age, this stage of his career is not going to wane. Like he he is he's a bear to deal with at the quarterback position. Uh, you know that the Eagles are going to be very motivated and they're going to frankly come into this opener ticked off about the end of last season. They had mm -hmm. to sit in that all off season. They're going to want nothing more than to show that that wasn't them, that they are better than what they put on film down the stretch last year from Nick Sirianni on down. And what better way to do that from a motivation standpoint than to go against that team that is head that was heading straight North. That star was absolutely rising from Jordan love on down. That, that's a great opportunity for them to put last season behind them. With that said, the Packers absolutely are catching a break as far as Brazil is to not be playing that game in Philly. They'd absolutely rather have that any anywhere on a neutral field. Brazil, Neptune, doesn't matter. They want that game on a neutral field rather than Philly. So that's going to be a really, a really interesting game. And, I, you know, I, I think it kind of sets a tone for both teams entering the season. With that said, the schedule does soften up for the Packers after that opener. Uh, it, it, there is a chance there, win or lose, to go on a run through September, early October. They have to do it because we thought the same last year. We thought 2023, mm -hmm. there's an early season opportunity here, and they were three and six. So they have to do it, but there is that opportunity. You're absolutely right. I, I And I think till you were mentioning how – for Philly, that is a, that is a, a home game, but we know Packers fans are going to travel to Brazil. So at yeah. best, that's yeah. a neutral site game. Throw in the fact that Jacksonville is one of the road games in the first half of the season. Come on, we know that's going to be a neutral site game too. So now we're talking about just a ton of basically neutral to home field opportunities in the first half of the season, which further softens things up. And really, I think just accelerates interest in the second half of the season. You get that by week in week 10, you haven't faced the Bears yet. You're going to face them right away out of the bye. Two games against Chicago and Caleb Williams, including one to close the season. That was the case last year with the playoffs on the line. That was thrilling. But you go at Chicago versus San Francisco 49ers. Of course, playoff rematch. That's going to be a huge game. That's right into Thanksgiving, the night game. First time since 2015 and the only other time since 2015 
that they will have played the night game on Thanksgiving, not against Detroit or Dallas, but against Miami at home. Miami, a playoff team last year. Then they go to Detroit Thursday night, back-to-back Thursday night games. That, of course, will be high profile, possibly for the North title. Then it's at Seattle. That's three primetime games in a row versus New Orleans at Minnesota versus Chicago to close it down. That is a wild second half to the season. And outside of that, I guess maybe the Minnesota game would be the one that might be the the, the easiest get as it looks on paper right now. I, I know Miami lost a lot of guys, but I still wouldn't rule them out as a playoff contender again this year. Chicago, you know, may not be a high caliber team, but New Orleans you know, at home. New Orleans yeah, at home. I, I mean, you never know there. So wild, wild second half of the season. Now that five game stretch out of the bye week to me is the season, not in terms of whether or not this team's going to go to the playoffs. I mean, I, I think that it would be a real surprise if they missed the playoffs. I'm not saying that, but in terms of maybe in the hunt for one seed opposed to a wild card, right. In a very competitive division. And it starts with that bears game because look, this is not, this is not yesteryear's bears. <laughs> like, this is, not only a team that drafted a very talented quarterback, a known very talented quarterback, but did a hell of a job aligning everything around Caleb Williams. I mean, th- there's a lot of talent in much the same way that Brian Gutekinds did with Jordan Love a year ago, putting a lot of talent around this first time starting quarterback. The, the Bears have done the same thing this offseason. They already had DJ Moore, but then you go out and you get Keenan Allen. You draft Roman Tunze. I, th- there's a lot of talent for, for Caleb Williams to have a, a, an ideal runway to lift off his career. I think it's going to be fascinating. And I think one of the storylines of the season, certainly underrated storylines, because everyone knows a renewal or a, a birth maybe of a, of a rivalry in the NFC North with the Packers and Lions. I mean, everyone knows that. But maybe the renewal of this Packers-Bears rival, I, I think that'll be very interesting to track. For sure. I think it's 15 of the last 20 games between the two teams. Packers have won. I don't even know. I don't even know what the winning streak is up to. Is it nine in a row? Ten in a row? I, I've, well, I've Matt LaFleur's never lost to them. Right. He's been a coach since 2019. That's, so that's, that's pretty that's great. That's 10. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. Oh, yeah. the Bears. Uh, yes, the Bears, I know, are itching to uh, to renew that rivalry. And and, and more than that. But, uh, but this is going to be a really interesting season. I mean, like I said, coming after the draft. Jordan Love is the third most interesting quarterback in the – NFC North now. He's not not the third best. He's probably, you know, you could probably still say maybe the best, maybe second, depending on how you feel about Goff or Williams, but he's definitely the third most. Jordan loves the guy. Jordan loves the guy in the NFC North based on mm-hmm. what he did last year until he proves otherwise. And he's got to still prove more to be considered the top dog in, in the NFC and certainly the NFL. He's not, he's not, the, you know, there's some, there's some rocket arms in the AFC. Yeah. But as far as the NFC North, look, Jordan Love is going to get paid more than $53 million a year. That's that's the new floor. The, the Detroit Lions set that as the new floor when they gave Jared Goff that because contracts are paid off of potential, off mm-hmm. of projection. And if you're projecting potential between Jordan Love and Jared Goff, it's not particularly close. No. Jared Goff has, been, has found the ideal relaunching spot for his career in Detroit. He personifies that comeback story, that comeback spirit of the city. Great match there. He's a quarterback they can clearly win with. He's also a quarterback that at the end of the NFC Championship game, when you need a touchdown from the one-yard line and you have multiple plays and enough timeouts to not have to kick an onside kick and you don't put the ball on the ground, they actually call the running play in that situation. And then they give that guy a $53 million a year contract. So, (laughs) you know, Detroit on some level is always going to Detroit a little bit. But – Jordan Jordan Love, he, he's he's a different guy in this division. And we'll see Caleb Williams. I mean, he's potential. His, his ceiling's very high, too. We'll, we'll have to actually see him on, on, yeah. on a field before we can start to gauge where that is. But Jordan Love's going to get north of 53. Well, thanks to Detroit for uh, for messing with the with the with the floor a little bit uh, in in signing Jared Goff to that contract. Because as we enter OTAs, this is one of the big storylines is is Jordan Love's contract situation. I've, I've kind of always been believing that it would be after June 1st. No reason to think that's changed now, but there's a little bit of, of whispering from the national guys who, by the way, have close relationships with agents. So it makes sense that they might say something, put something in the ether like, oh, if a deal gets done and oh, the two sides are far apart. Uh, a little bit of theater, if you ask me, but it is worth asking if you know, we have operated under the assumption that this would be a done deal at some point, that Jordan Love will, of course, sign this extension. But that's really from the point of view of the Packers. The Packers are going to want him to sign the extension. 
what does Jordan Love want? You know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe there is some reason for him to wait or to, I don't know, ask for more. I, I don't know. How, uh, how do you see this playing out? Look, business deals, especially in a market that's changing and the quarterback market is changing right now. We saw that with Jared Goff. Business deals don't get done quickly. Not if, not if you have any business savvy. <laughs> there's no rush here, right? No. Uh, certainly not from Jordan Love's side, there's no rush because there's another quarterback, Tua, in Miami, who's also going to get paid. Mm -hmm. And so whoever's whoever gets that contract first is not going to get the highest contract. That's not how this works. So it's a staring contest. Yeah, it's essentially what it is. I mean, look at what happened with the receiver market this this offseason. You know, a lot of receivers got paid. Who's, who, 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 who's been last now? Who, who, who's still – it's Justin Jefferson. It's the best one. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know that if you're last, you're, you're more. So this is going to not be overnight. This is going to take some time. How long will it take? I think is interesting. I, the, the longer look, you know, if they report to camp and the deal's not done, you start to wonder. And maybe not right away. I mean, it's not a this huge distraction week one, but if you get to actual week one of the season, not week one of camp, yeah, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that a deal has to be done by the uh, by the opener. You know, um, I would think that that if there's a deadline, that's what it is. But it's not going to be a sprint to that deadline. This, you know, Jordan Love, I can't imagine that he's in a, 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 a mood to not take less than what he feels he deserves after doing being, being the good soldier for three years behind Aaron Rodgers, after proving his worth last year, the highest quarterback passer rating in the NFL down the final two months, after getting this team to the divisional playoff round and, and within a whisker of the NFC championship game, showing what he can be and what, what he is now, what he, what his potential is. I don't think he's going to be taking less than what he feels he deserves. So it's going to take some time. Yeah. We'll be interesting to see if he's there, how much he's there, you know, and, and obviously mini camp is not that far away either. That's in, I think the second week of June. So, you know, this is, there's going to be opportunities to, to see how, if he's there, how he interacts, things, things of that nature. I know there's questions about whether Tua will, uh, will be reporting right away to Miami as well. Uh, this is the song and dance that happens every year. What here, here, let me add one thing. Here's what we know about Jordan Love though. There's no, there's no, this is not an animosity situation. Mm. There, there's no rift here between him and the team. I think that's important to point out. Do you know how we know that? Because he was front and center in the Packers schedule release video. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he was he was all smiling like there there there's this is not a bad situation this is just business as it is and everyone knows that I mean this this is far away far away from being any type of animus but yeah, yeah. it's just gonna take some time Jordan Love by the way nice comic timing uh, I think uh, I think he's one of the stars of the schedule release video because Ryan I'm gonna be honest with you I didn't love the Packers schedule release video I feel like teams have been talked into doing one of these by the success that some teams have had and now everybody has to do one. Man, I didn't think the Packers one was very good. I feel bad they put so much work into it. We know people who were in it. I didn't get it. I didn't get why there was like there there was just like this big long thing, and then oh, at the very end, here's the schedule. You know, there was no tie-in. I don't know how you feel about it, Ryan. I, I I have so many thoughts. There, I, I don't want to be mean because I, I like a lot of those people, but it was it was a big grimace face for me. I don't have a lot of thoughts. I watched it. Uh, <laughs> I thought that they made more of an effort than last year oh, i can't even remember what last year was so i give yeah. you know credit there i think david bakhtiari got on them for not having anything more prepared but last year last year was the soft yeah. launch of the schedule release concept i didn't really have any thoughts beyond that <laughs> if i'm being honest like yeah. I'm, I'm not this isn't throwing shade i good effort i i don't i didn't i don't really care yeah. about schedule release videos no it's a brand new thing to care about. We we no. had no. This was not a thing two years ago. So right, uh, right. You know, I was I was disappointed that the Titans couldn't recapture the magic of 2023 in theirs. Really? They tried. We tried going back to the well, which didn't didn't seem to work. Yeah, I don't think. But no, you know, and I understand why because the, 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 the 2023 video like uh, that had me laughing for months. <laughs> I mean, just I, it never got old. Yeah, it might have gotten old. You know, it, it they just Maybe. couldn't, couldn't recapture the magic from that video. But other than that, I, I did. I don't think I had any thoughts on schedule release videos around the league. That was just the the one thought I had was the Titans one. Yeah, Chargers. I think won this year's schedule release. If we're keeping score, but uh, man, that Titans video last year, I was just belly laughing. I, I you was know, crying. Like, 
I cried too. I was crying, <laughs> cry laughing, like 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 not subtly. Like I was sob, cry laughing. Yeah. It was unbelievably funny. You can't you can't recapture that, especially no. now when it's like okay, well every team's got to do one. You got to outdo the other. We got to come up with something. I mean, it's it's a very difficult spot to be in. So, uh, all respect to the Packers social team. They 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 yeah, tried exactly. a lot. Effort is good. Effort is good. Effort is good. Uh, and Jordan Love, good comic timing. I, I really, yeah. uh, I really think he's got a future there. Um, Jordan Love's been out there this year. Like he's been in sidelines right. of games. Like he's living, living the life now. Ryan, it's good. I thought that too. Like you know, I think the best example of this that we've that I've ever seen in my ten now going on eleven years on on the Packers beat. The best example of this is David Bakhtiari. Mm -hmm. His first couple years, this guy who we know now has a massive personality. I mean, massive. Uh -huh. it, it, bigger personality than than even his his body like he, he he's a huge left tackle bigger personality the first couple of years he, he didn't say a whole lot uh -huh. and he was on this veteran offensive line with ryan balaga tj lang josh Sitton. he didn't say a whole lot and uh you kind of wondered if there was much personality in there but once he became the guy and david bakhtiari obviously became the guy you saw the personality come out Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he's chugging beers at Milwaukee Bucks <laughs> playoff games, right? It. And it's like, oh, okay, nope. The personality question is checked. Mm -hmm. Jordan Love, uh, people ask me how Jordan Love was to deal with from a media standpoint last year. And my, my answer was, he was refreshingly boring. <laughs> like, it was, yeah, like he was, he, he was pretty boring, right? From personality, mm -hmm. he didn't yeah. give you a lot in the answers, but like, you didn't have to check the Pat McAfee show every Tuesday to figure. Oh God, what the quarterback say now? Mm -hmm. uh, that was nice. I did. I I did not miss the drama that preceded him. Right, refreshingly boring. But I also kind of want like, look, he is in his first year as a starter, replacing an absolute legend, a Hall of Famer, and Aaron Rodgers. He is going to come in and put his head down, as a lot of young players do. He's going to focus on his work. He's going to focus on proving it. And after he does that, if he does that, and he did. What happens after that? Well, I think we're starting to see the personality come out. And I think mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, last year, a lot of it was what kind of leader is Jordan Love going to be as a first time starting quarterback? Now it's what kind of personality is he going to have now, now that he is the leader, now, now that he, he is the face of the franchise. I think that'll be fun to watch. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, okay, so what else from OTAs sticks out? I got a few things that I know I'm personally interested in knowing, but but as you head into this part of the season, are there questions you think that can be answered this week at, at the Don Hudson Center? Yeah, it's it's all this time of year is all about reps. Who's taking the reps and where? It's not about the football. It's not about the football until the pads get strapped a couple days into camp. That's when it becomes about, okay, real football. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time that we're seeing another bloated rookie class that Brian Gutekinds drafted in with 11 players with the full roster. How does that shake out? Who are getting the reps and where? Talking, obviously, offensive line. Uh, I think from now until through camp, backup quarterbacks want to be something we watch. I mean, we're going to obviously be watching Jordan Love, but there's a lot known about Jordan Love now compared to a year ago. Sean Clifford, Michael Pratt, that's going to be worth watching. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd, A.J. Dillon, that's going to be worth yeah, watching. Backup running back for sure. The, the young receiving core, all right? Uh, there are a lot of talented guys there. And we know that. But how do they, how do they continue as they develop to kind of sift through the pecking order? There, that's going to be worth watching. You say the same with Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft. The difference being that you can actually use those two together much more frequently, and kind of the creativity. John Dunn, the Packers tight ends coach, said it's endless opportunities to be creative in this in this uh, scheme with Matt Lafleur with those two tight ends. Well, do we start to see some of that? Uh, the defensive side, obviously. What does a 4-3 defense look like in Green Bay? Obviously, yeah. look, it's going to be a nickel defense. It's going to be 4-2-5. Uh, I think it'll be very interesting where Javon Bullard gets the reps. I think mm -hmm. uh, I'm expecting it to be safety to start off. But Javon Bullard, to me, kind of profiles long-term as that classic star defensive back. I mean, he can play a lot in, in the nickel, in the slot. Uh, how long does it take for him to start getting cross-trained there? Are they really focused on him taking that starting safety position opposite of Xavier McKinney from, from the gate? How, how how do you get the ref? So, you know, the third linebacker, who's the Sam? I don't know. I, th there are a lot of linebackers that have, you know, from Quay Walker, Edron Cooper, that have that athletic body type, little undersized, 
great length, sideline to sideline, can move all over the field. Not your, your prototypical thump that you get at Sam. So who, who is the Sam? I, I don't know. There's a lot of questions that are going to be answered when it comes to who are getting the reps and where. Yeah, I think the secondary for me is so interesting. Has has just a lot of stories. You mentioned Javon Bullard. I mean, Evan Williams. We won't see we won't see Oladapo right away with as he's coming back from injury. But a lot of new Kalen King. A lot of a lot of newbies back there. The the coaching staff has been so effusive in their praise of Xavier McKinney. Like they they cannot stop talking about how much they love him. So I'm curious to see him, you know, on the field and kind of what element he brings. And and then there's the cornerbacks like. Eric Stokes, I feel like we've talked about, is kind of coming up. It's it's do or die for Eric Stokes. I mean, some of that's a health question, but can can he contribute? He's he's got so much promise, and you know hasn't been able to stay on the field. And is, are those injuries going to sap that speed and take that asset away from him? You know, how can he contribute on this team? I, I feel like the secondary is. It's not that they're lacking for weapons. It's just I don't know how it ultimately shakes out. You mentioned like where's where does Bullard play is a big a big part of that equation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the part I'm so interested in. And you, you mentioned linebackers like Isaiah McDuffie. I, I don't know if people, he's going to be really important for this team this year. So that's another guy that I'm watching kind of closely. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's just a, there's a lot to look forward to. I, I think it is exciting to see that. I think maybe the defense really can take a step forward this year. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that takes shape. We do end up kind of learning a little bit at OTAs, like, oh, that doesn't look like it's working yet. And sometimes that stuff does bear out. There are, there are some early impressions that do matter, I feel like. Now, here's a question at linebacker. I want to get back to secondary, but here's a question at linebacker. Who wears the green dot? I mean, Quay Walker probably would be mm -hmm. the most likely on, you know, theoretically, because he's going to be on the field more than Isaiah McDuffie. Isaiah McDuffie is not going to be on the field in nickel. So, Quay Walker knows the defense. He's not the rookie. Edron Cooper is. That would seem to make the most sense if it's going to be a linebacker. Mm -hmm. But you want to free Quay Walker. Just go run and hit. You know, like, you know, the, the less thinking, the better react. And you wear the green dot. There's a lot of thinking involved in that. Mm -hmm. Could this be a situation where it's Xavier McKinney? Where they move to safety. And he's in charge of the communication. Obviously, they've got a, uh, a defensive coordinator that comes from a secondary track. So, how does that influence who wears the green dot? I think that that's going to be very interesting to watch. Get, getting back to the secondary, though, safety and corner are in such different situations. Mm -hmm. Safety is completely remade, right? Other than Anthony Johnson Jr., there isn't a safety on this roster that factored on defense last year. Everyone else is new. Uh, how does that shake out? Like the learning process. The you know obviously it's a first year defense coordinator for this team, so that that. Kind of, they, they, they kind of everyone's learning together but learning each other they're all strangers right they're they're all newly acquainted they're getting to know each other now not the same way at corner that that's the opposite of a remade position the only significant addition that brian gudek has made at corner is kaylin king a seventh round rookie but you want to talk about a position that is hinging on so many what ifs right from jair alexander what if he regains, recaptures that form as an elite cover man that we know he can be, that we saw him be in Dallas last year, late last season. If he's refocused, remotivated, he drops the shenanigans that led to mm -hmm. the suspension last year. If he's healthy and he's a tr he's Jair Alexander again, well, that on its own changes the, the, the potential, the ceiling of this quarterback position dramatically from last year. But it goes on to Carrington Valentine. What if he builds on being a, a really a revelation as a seventh round rookie last year? Keyshawn Nixon. What if this is the coaching staff that gets the best out of Keyshawn Nixon? Because the best out of Keyshawn Nixon last year was a really good nickel corner. The problem is there was no consistency. And the other half of the time, he's blowing coverages, missing tackles in really bad moments. I, you know, there needs to be consistency there. Well, what if this is the coaching staff to bring that out of him? What if Eric Stokes can finally stay on the field? It's been a year and a half at this point since he's consistently been on the field. And it looked like that when he did come back and played a few reps last season. He looked like a corner who hadn't been on the field much. He hadn't played much football. And that's that's a, that can be a devastating thing for a young player this early in their career. But we also know he, that, that Eric Stokes, as a rookie in 2021, he showed himself to be a first-round pick. He, he, he proved that he could play in this league. So what if he can stay on the field? If, if the Packers get all those what ifs to hit, right? They're kind of at the casino when it comes to the, the, the quarterback position. If they get all, all of them to hit, 
this cornerback position is in really good shape. Ryan Gudikins is right. But there's a lot of risk and gamble involved there because if they don't get all those to hit, it, it gets thin real quick. So that, that's going to be something to track throughout the offseason and, and even early into next season. I'll flip quickly back to the other side of the ball. You mentioned, you know, the receivers and the and the tight ends and running backs especially are pretty interesting. Backup quarterback. Offensive line is pretty interesting. Jordan Morgan, their first round draft pick. It, it We don't know for sure where he's going to line up. If he, if he is in that starting five, where he's going to line up exactly. A lot of options there, a lot of options throughout that line. I don't know. It, I, this is more of a question about like the OTA process. Do When you see five guys at OTA's lineup, is that typically where they end up? Like, is that a really good indicator of what's to come? Or does it just begin the experimentation process? And we, we won't know for a while what, what's starting to look like their best five. I would say it's somewhere in the middle. I, I would say it's 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 not something that changes a whole lot, but it's not completely static either, right? Okay. It, it, what we know about Jordan Morgan is that they're going to fail him from left tackle. They're going to give him the first shot at left tackle. If he fails from there, they'll move him around. But they want him to be their left tackle. He's going to have to compete with Rasheed Walker. Played a very good left tackle last season. But Rasheed Walker, from everything I saw last year, the guy he, he's a good enough run blocker. The guy can play right tackle too. Right, it's not like left tackle or bust for Rasheed Walker in a way that it might have been for Yash Nyman. I know that they tried him at right tackle, but Yash Nyman did not fare well at right tackle. He was a much better left tackle. Rasheed Walker, he 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 can play. He, he, and we got he's got to go. We got to see him do it. But he he looks like a guy like with his run blocking, his toughness. He can play the right side. So that's you know if Jordan Morgan's the left tackle, Rasheed Walker versus Zach Tom. And if there's one question, I want to ask. To one player on in, in this locker room, it's Zach Tom. How much do you not want to move to center? <laughs> yeah. Because, like, look, yeah, he can be a Hall of Fame center. That That's great. Hall of Fame centers don't get paid like quality right tackles. Mm. That's not the same thing. That's not what the market is. If you're a quality right tackle, why on earth would you want to do anything but be a, paid like a quality right tackle? It's just, you know, it, you can think all you want about Zach Tom being better. I, I've been saying this since the middle of last year. Look, I think Zach Tom guard or center. He, he be, I think he'd be an all pro there. He, he'd be better inside. Doesn't mean that you get paid better. So I think that's going to be very interesting to, to hear from Zach Tom. And, you know, cause there is, there's a starting right guard battle p- position open that if, if Jordan Morgan wins left tackle, if Rasheed Walker wins right tackle, Josh Myers is going to be the center in 2024. Long term, we don't know. He's going to be the center in 2024. Mm-hmm. Josh Myers has never gotten a legitimate threat for his starting job at center since he's been here. It's not going to change now. But there is a starting right guard position with again Sean Ryan potentially open. You know, it's I think it's a, a, one of the more fascinating aspects of this entire roster is is the offensive line, but especially. Zach Tom's a really good right tackle. Why would you want to be paid like anything but a really good right tackle? Yeah, speaking of Hall of Fame centers, Jim Otto uh, passing away on Monday as we record this. He's from Wausau, uh, 1980 Hall of Fame, Pro Football Hall of Fame inductee, longtime Raiders uh, Raiders star. I think he's like an 11-time All-Pro or something ridiculous. So just speaking of Hall of Fame centers made me think of that. Uh, he was 88 years old, but uh, but one of the greats, one of the great Wisconsin football players of all time. Um, okay, before we let I let you go, we got while well, we're here, now that we're at OTAs, we can start talking about special teams again. Uh, the kicker situation is, is going to be up in the air. The long snapper situation is going to be up in the air. Um, again, I, I kind of go back to that question I just asked. Like, if you learn anything in OTAs about special team reps, I don't. Sometimes I feel like you don't learn anything about special team reps at any point. It's all about what happens in games because guys can drill shot after shot in practice and then it just doesn't translate. I kind of feel like Anders Carlson was somewhat in that boat. I don't know, but give me uh, give me your take on what uh, how that's going to transpire. Fierce competition from. Now, and it's started at the beginning of the offseason, but from now to the end of training camp, they right. badly want Anders Carlson to be the guy because when you use a draft pick on a specialist, you don't want it to burn out Right. second season. That is bad. For all the great drafting that Brian Gudikins has done lately, that would be really, really bad. That's wasteful. Uh, they badly want him to win it, but they also know that they're not the team they were – last year at least the team that thought they might be last year like a year ago they didn't know who they were going to be they certainly did not expect to contend as dramatically and quickly as they did last year they didn't see this the season ending in the nfc divisional playoff round in san francisco 
with yeah. a very real chance to not only get to the NFC Championship game, but win that game and get to the Super Bowl. They didn't see that coming. Now they do. Now they know they're contenders. And they are bound and determined, regard, no matter what, to not have the d- disaster of a kicking situation from last year repeat itself. Because as bad as it would be to miss on Anders Carlson, there is something worse, and that's the kicking situation last year, now that you're a contender. That is far worse. So it's going to be a, a – we're talking about competition. It's going to be as fierce a competition you see on this roster. Riz Versace is not going to leave a stone unturned to make sure that he gets the right guy in that position because – this is a team now that is expecting late season big games that hinge on potentially big kicks. Yeah, I think if they if they could have gone back and known what they know now, they would have they would have probably moved on from Mason Crosby a year earlier, work in a new kicker, figure out if the, you know for that season that didn't end and the way they wanted it to, and then uh, maybe that guy is a little bit better better suited to be in a playoff run, uh, as was as was the case here in uh, in, in the twenty twenty three season. Anything else, Ryan? Before I uh, before I send you away? Well, you're missing. You dropped that Jim Otto. Right. I did, yes. Which is not surprising because, JR, as we know, you are the expert on, on Wisconsin athletes. I, mean, <laughs> I do keep track of the Wisconsin athletes of the world, yes. My wife it is it's annoying. She's like, you only care about him because he's from Wisconsin. And I'm like, guilty. That's right. That's true. I'm uh, sorry. You you are a, a walking textbook on <laughs> Wisconsin athletes. So I, I thought I'd ask the, the textbook, do, do, do we have to wait to crown Tyrese Halliburton the greatest basketball player ever from the state of Wisconsin? Or, or you know, is, is that fair to do so now? So we have to wait because he needs a little bit of longevity first. You, uh, Latrell Sprewell is, yeah. is a guy that we'd probably have to throw out there, multiple-time All-Star. But Tyrese uh, Halliburton as a two-time All-Star, that's better yeah. than, I think, every other Wisconsin guy that's come before him. Now, our, our, our boss, Robert Zizzo, Threw out a couple names. Those are yeah. those are quality guys. Fred yeah. Brown was one of the names. Terry Porter, who had a really nice career with the Blazers, you know, went to uh, went to some finals. They were one time all stars. Like that, that's a big deal in the NBA when only a small subset of guys become all stars. Tyrese is two already, and he's twenty four, whatever, twenty five. Um, Terry Porter had two himself, by the way. And yes, he had a okay. long career, which is you know, to your point. Yes, there's longevity there that matters. But two so I should have changed him if he had two. I thought he only had one. But but yes, like Tyrese is on track for sure to being uh, the Oshkosh North product, to being the, the greatest Wisconsin basketball player. You know, Devin Harris played forever, one time All Star, but like had a really nice career. There are, there are guys that you probably have to rank ahead of him now. But I mean, especially if Indiana <laughs> wins, beats Boston, it's going to get harder and harder. He's going to be he's going to be the guy. Oh, it's happening, Jr. It might be. You're already here first. Pacers into the into the NBA Finals for the first the first time since 2000, second time ever. Yes, I'm a big Pacers fan, lifelong yeah. from Indiana. Uh, I, I just I'm just relishing how many Bucks fans were uh, filling my Twitter mentions two weeks ago about how the Pacers weren't going to win a game against the Knicks, and now it's like, mm-hmm. oh no, it's not that impressive. You know, they, they were all injured and everything. Well, wait a second, <laughs> two weeks ago it was like, oh, the Pacers are going to get swept. They're going to lose mm-hmm. all four games. No, it uh, you got to the Pacers play the brand of ball that the NBA is built on now from depth to pace to scoring oodles of points. Mm-hmm. There's not much defense in the league. So when your team doesn't play much defense, you kind of get away with just filling it up. Uh, it's going to be fun. But Ty- yeah. Tyrese Halliburton, he's the truth, man. I- I- I'll take Latrell Sprewell right, right now, this moment in time, five all-star games. He's been the best t- player on teams that went far, but yeah, uh, I don't think it's much team. more. I don't, I don't think it's many more years until Tyrese Halliburton is going to be that guy. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's fair. I tell you what, when the Knicks went up two nothing, I thought they were gonna they were gonna sweep the Pacers too. I thought, okay, this is bo- curtains. I did not I did not think Indiana would get back into that series, but you have little wrong. faith. No, I, I no look. I, I think a lot of people know that I'm, I'm a fairly big Mets fan, right? Yeah, from Indiana. Like I, I haven't kept that a secret. People don't know the Pacers thing with me because. They haven't won a playoff series since 2014. That's the What's my first beat. I've been here since 2014, and they've done nothing. So, <laughs> JR, I was with you. I had zero expectation of them winning this series. Uh, and I don't think they're going to win against Boston either. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to spark a little faith. Yep. You got to believe in what you don't see. An eighth seed went to the uh, you know NBA Finals last year out of the East. So what? An eighth seed went to the NBA Finals in 1999 against the Indiana Pacers, too, as the New York Knicks. I remember. Uh-huh. With? Who was on that team? The Trails 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 Trails. Well. And Alex. Oh, I hated that team. Well, I was not a fan. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, uh, we got it. Full circle. A lot of a uh, lot of football, a little bit of basketball. He is Ryan Wood of PackersNews.com. Find everything he has there on this team. He'll be at OTAs this week. Lots uh, lots of interesting updates. Follow him on Twitter as well by Ryan Wood, and uh, you can get uh, get some some real time updates there as well. Ryan, thank you for joining me. We'll chat with you again very soon. Take care.